the, the topic today is uh, about, uh, of this seminar is about unmanned vehicles in smart agriculture. Uh, where does this seminar come from? As uh, Professor Gambella said, it comes from uh, the activities that we are carrying out uh, within uh, the Comfort Drones project that I will present at the end uh, of the presentation. Uh, but uh, to, let's say, to locate uh, ourselves uh, with respect to what the rest of the work uh, is doing, we really dig uh, on the state of the art, uh, on the literature, to understand uh, where our technologies uh, are located uh, or can be helpful with respect to the context of application uh, that it's uh, the, the smart farming. Um, in, in the slides, uh, I didn't put uh, uh, the, the, the motivation for working in this field, but I will share with you, um, but I will share with you if it goes further. Okay, but I will share with you a, a paper that we have uh, written and that for us uh, is, uh, um, is the reference of this lecture. As soon as we finish this lecture, I will share the, the paper. And, um, and basically in this paper, there's uh, uh, all uh, the motivations for investing this kind of technologies in the concept of smart agriculture. It is uh, the, the first time that I've approached this subject. Uh, I was speaking with Filippo uh, and Filippo told me that uh, there's a principle to be respected in agriculture that is uh, being uh, capable of performing the correct action or treatment exactly when is needed and where is needed. This is uh, the, the main assumption of agriculture. Um, this, this is uh, the, the concept uh, that Filippo shared with me, the first thing that I approached uh, uh, about this kind of topics. And clearly to be able to, to perform the correct action or treatment, uh, you need to know you need to know in details what is happening, you know, and, and knowing in details, uh, for sure, uh, a human operator can do it. Traditionally, historically, human operators uh, has always performed uh, these, uh, these kind of tasks in the agriculture, but we know that machines uh, might be very precise. So they can help a lot uh, in, in doing these, uh, these uh, analysis from one side and treatment, uh, precise treatment on the other. So these are the concepts that I'm sure uh, you already know from, uh, from, this, uh, fr from this course uh, uh, that, that is completing today uh, for going for smart and precision agriculture. Uh, Filippo told you already that uh, this research uh, that we are carrying out together is funded by the European Commission. And why the European is, Commission is investing money, really real money, on uh, uh, this kind of research? Because uh, uh, this is uh, behind this topic, there's uh, uh, a huge, a very important societal challenge. Uh, from the forecasts uh, that are uh, around, we know that uh, the world food production is expected to double from here to 2050. Because uh, uh, we are increasing as population, because we are more demanding than in the past. What is not going to change for sure is uh, the amount of fields that are available. So we need to improve production by knowing that uh, the resources, the physical one, I mean the, the soil, will not double itself. So investing on precision and smart agriculture to, to make, to increase the production, to make the production, uh, to make the production better in general, in terms of volume, in terms of quality, it is uh, something that uh, uh, really implies a huge societal challenge, a huge, a huge societal benefit. And these are the motivations uh, uh, in, in general at the, at the base uh, of uh, um, the investments of the European Commission 
uh, that we exploited uh, to, carry it, to carry out uh, uh, our research. I will share in any case uh, the document with these numbers, so don't, uh, don't get scared from the fact that uh, uh, you don't see uh, this number in the presentation. Uh, how is this uh, seminar organized? Uh, it will be um, organized in four different sections. In the first one, I will try to recall you some concepts that I assume that you should have, either from uh, uh, Professor Gambella's course, either from uh, uh, the architecture course or from my course. Uh, and Clearly, uh, if you have any doubts, raise the hand, uh, interrupt me. Uh, at the moment, uh, I'm using uh, the, with the PDF, uh, I don't see the chat. So uh, really interrupt me and uh, don't get scared about uh, um, speaking on top of me uh, because I cannot see the, 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 the Teams uh, um, menu at the moment. Uh, the second part and the third part will be given by Daniel Madronial. Daniel is, uh, as uh, Filippo said, uh, a research assistant. Uh, he, he did his uh, studies uh, and his PhD in Madrid, uh, and, uh, and then he came uh, in, in Sassari two months ago, uh, more or less, uh, uh, to start working with uh, my group. His research is uh, totally focused on uh, the architecture uh, um, that we are developing in Comfort Drones uh, that you will know about in the last part of the presentations, uh, which will be given again uh, by me. So, starting with the previous concepts, uh, I want to start uh, with uh, uh, presenting uh, the generic architecture of a drone. I'm sure that you already know it, but I need to refresh uh, uh, or to make sure, I would say, that, that uh, we are on the same page and we have the same uh, starting concepts. How is it composed, uh, a, a drone? Uh, here is, uh, you, you have a quadrotor, okay? But uh, this, this architecture is uh, fairly generic. And uh, if, you, if you change uh, uh, the rotors with the, with the wheels, it can be, the same concept can be applied to can be applied to a rover too. Uh, for sure, the core of, uh, of, a, of a drone is, is certainly the flight controller. Uh, the flight controller is composed of two parts, hardware and software. The, the, you need the, the, the hardware uh, board, the flight controller board, and a software to perform the control tasks uh, uh, that is running on it. It controls uh, the motors, uh, uh, it interfaces uh, 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 with all the internal and external sensors, it, it implements all the attitude estimation, the control load, the navigations, many, many tasks uh, that, that you will see in, in the rest of the presentation. And it's capable of normally of exchanging data that can be controlled or uh, data acquired through the sensors. Uh, with uh, the ground stations or other vehicles. There are many different types of flight controller. Uh, I think you may have seen some of them uh, during uh, uh, the course of Professor Gambella. There are many of them that are open source, uh, where both the, the platform, uh, the, the hardware and the software are, are, are open source and uh, uh, even uh, different types of uh, computing cores can be used uh, within the, fl fl the flight controller. There are some flight controllers that are ARM-based, others that are Arduino-based. Most of them are uh, using 32-bit processors. Uh, and in general, uh, um, besides the, con the flight controlling things, uh, uh, all of these uh, controllers uh, do have uh, many, many uh, different uh, um, ports to be able to interact uh, with the external world. When I'm saying ports, uh, I mean, you can see some of them in the picture, like the UART, like the CAN. Uh, so th th there are many different uh, ports that can use to interact with the peripherals or with the, the, with the sensors. Speaking uh, 
about the movement. Uh, uh, the flight is, uh, how does it fly? Uh, normally, there are many different type of drones, uh, uh, fixed wings, uh, um, not fixed wings, uh, uh, multi-rotor, uh, in any case, uh, in, in this picture we have, uh, in this example, we have, uh, we are uh, presenting a multi-rotor UAV uh, <coughs> that is operated using a brushless DC motor that uses uh, this uh, electronic speed controller, ESC, uh, to uh, be able to control uh, uh, the motors. Uh, smaller drones uh, could use different type of uh, motors, like brushed ones, uh, getting rid of uh, the part of uh, the ESC. Uh, in any case, as, as said, uh, the, the, there are many, many different types, but you need to, to make sure that the flight controller is able to uh, control uh, the, um, uh, the motors uh, uh, that connect to the rotors or connect to the wheels. Uh, in this generic architecture, for sure, uh, you will have uh, many, many different sensors. Uh, Daniel, in his part, uh, will present uh, uh, the different sensors and uh, what they are used for. For sure, what we can say is that these sensors uh, are needed to detect or to observe uh, uh, the surroundings. And so one of the reasons, let's make a practical example st straight away. Uh, I can use a sensor to uh, make obstacle avoidance. So to be able that, that I'm not uh, uh, crashing uh, on, on a tree, for example. There are many different sensors. Uh, Online, for sure, you would have an inertial measurement unit. Uh, the inertial memory, mm, measurement unit is uh, the main component uh, of the inertial navigation system. And um, basically, it is used uh, in combination with uh, gyroscopes and accelerometers to uh, estimate uh, uh, the UAV's attitude. Uh, then, uh, you might, you, you should have normally uh, the barometer and uh, uh, the global nav navigation satellite systems that interact with the GPS uh, to allow uh, to understand where the drone is, uh, so to locate uh, the drone. In more advanced uh, archi drone architecture, there are also uh, GPS, so drone without GPS uh, uh, architectures. Uh, for example, in the Comfort Drones, we are studying the possibility of uh, ensuring the perfect location, uh, the, the understanding of the per perfect location of the drones without using the GPS. This is uh, possible by leveraging or on really advanced computation. And uh, the, the people that are studying these aspects uh, are investing on bringing on boards of the of the of the drone some uh, uh, magnet, let's say a set of magnetometers, and uh, uh, they understand from the North Pole positioning and what is the position of of the drone. It is not that easy, and it entails a lot of research. Then uh, I. Besides all these uh, standard uh, sensors, uh, there are many other different sensors that can be used uh, and depends uh, on uh, the type of application that the, that the drone is intended for. Cameras are for sure the first and most important example for us uh, of additional sensor that you may find on board. Then uh, it is uh, in this generic architecture, I wanted to uh, mention uh, the presence of, of the ground station, which does not belong to the UAV architecture itself, but uh, you always have it. Uh, normally you always have it. And uh, uh, basically on this uh, uh, ground station, uh, you, you should have a software running uh, that is able to exchange uh, information data to control uh, the flying, to set uh, the waypoints, to, to, to um, define 
a target where the, 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 the drone should fly or should move to. Again, in terms of software, there are many different types of software. Uh, mission planner, APM uh, planner, and most of them, some of them are open source, uh, others are, are not open source. And, uh, and it is important to understand that there are, that there are uh, um, fixed communication protocol uh, between uh, the uh, ground station and, and, the, and the drone or the rover. And uh, a very common one, uh, open source one, is called Mavlink. But uh, I will uh, I will talk about Mavlink in the last part uh, of, of the presentation. Uh, last but not least, you might have a radio controller uh, uh, or radio control transmitter uh, that is uh, used uh, to control the the drone mu movement uh, and to exchange. Uh, command uh, uh, that are mapped into pulse width modulation or on par position modulation. These uh, commands uh, are uh, um, received through the transmitter, uh, exchanged uh, through, as I said, the PWM or PPM uh, with uh, uh, the, the flight controller and the flight controller uh, translate them uh, into actions uh, for uh, uh, the motors transmitting data through the uh, to the ESG to operate uh, towards a certain location, for example. Mm -hmm. This is from the architectural point of view. Let's say more than architectural, I would say in terms of building block. And I'm assuming that uh, this was uh, familiar to all of you. In terms of generic execution, for me, it is important that you uh, complete this seminar with a clear idea. Uh, in terms of execution, uh, what do we have? Uh, typically, if we, uh, if we use a drone, we can identify what is called mission time. That is the time be be in between, uh, clearly, the kickoff and the landing of the drone. In between uh, or during a mission, in between kickoff and landing, for sure, what you can do in terms of execution is to run some online processing that are all the tasks that are carried out during the mission itself on board of the drone. And please uh, remind this, uh, this term, on board of the drone. It means that you need some computing platform on board to carry out uh, a specific tasks. That is not just uh, controlling the flight itself, or it might be not just controlling the flight itself. Then after the landing, the, the work, uh, uh, or uh, let's say the, um, the benefit of having used the drone is not completed because uh, actually you can run a lot of offline processing, a lot of post-processing, uh, not necessarily on the ground station. You can do it, you can bring all the data that you collected, that you stored uh, or on, on board of the drone or that you sent to the ground station uh, offline, you can bring them offline, you can uh, uh, work in the lab or at home, wherever you want yeah. on, an external, <laughs> on an external workstation to do more understanding about what happened. I mean, uh, the, not there are tasks uh, and uh, and probably when uh, when Daniel will do his part of his presentation that will become clearer that should and can be done online on the computing platform on board of the drone rover whatever and whatever unmanned vehicle we are talking about and other tasks like crown tree volume evaluation grape count because at the moment uh, the grape count that uh, Luca has presented uh, last week or two weeks ago uh, is uh, certainly done offline. Those tasks are performed afterwards, so when the mission is finished. But today, this seminar is focusing specifically to what you can do or what you should be able to do online. This part of the preliminaries uh, for the seminar, it is I mean, I've seen in the participants of this seminar that 
many known names, so probably I will go fast on, on this since uh, you have uh, seen probably this, these slides before in my course. You know that uh, uh, there, there has been a lot of evolution in terms of integration on, uh, uh, on chip, on silicon uh, in, in the last decades, okay? So uh, we started from uh, uh, very few logic ports uh, integrated on a single die back in 60s. Uh, and, and we are arriving now to, to having multiprocessor system on a single chip uh, where you have uh, more than ultra, ultra large scale integration, okay? So uh, basically, uh, for sure, uh, at the moment we are capable. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, already old. This is a 2017 chip. Uh, is is a quad core chip from uh, from Intel. It uses uh, a 14 nanometers technology, and you know what I mean when I'm talking about 14 nanometers technology. It means that uh, uh, the gate length on uh, the of the transistors that I'm using uh, to build uh, this chip is 14 nanometers. Uh, but currently, the technology nodes uh, went uh, even farther. They are even smaller than 14 nanometers. Uh, and uh, uh, you know th that uh, the, mm, there, there's a lot that can be done on, 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 a, single, on a single chip. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, these two pictures uh, are um, here for, to give you uh, additional examples uh, and uh, to, to make you understand what is the current level of integration on, 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 uh, on a single die. And you can see here where we are. I mean, this uh, number is incre incredibly huge. Uh, and, uh, probably it will continue growing. The progress of CMOS technology today uh, really allows uh, for um, transistor in the size of uh, smaller than 14 nanometers, as I said in the previous slide. Uh, we can pack uh, uh, on an entire system uh, on, on a single chip. We are talking not as about system on chip anymore. We are talking about multiprocessor system on chip because uh, we have more, uh, definitely more than one. Um, so what are the type of platforms uh, that we are used uh, to, th that we know from, uh, from previous courses? For sure, you have seen a lot about uh, CPUs in Calcolatori Electronici, in the architecture uh, course. And, and you know that uh, uh, more or less uh, till 2005, uh, we were talking uh, mostly about single core architecture when, where just one CPU was there. And from uh, 2005 on, uh, we are talking about multi-core. Uh, we were able, thanks to the integration capabilities on chip, we were able to talk about uh, uh, multi-core architecture. Uh, in this picture, this is a very simple picture, and uh, four cores uh, are depicted here, but uh, there are architecture that are even massively parallel. There are some chips uh, that are uh, like the MPPA processor that integrates many, many cores up to 64 cores, uh, if I remember correctly. So uh, basically the computational power on chip is, uh, is really currently extremely huge. Pros and cons. Development time, you know, the development time is, is short. Basically, you have an architecture, you, you just you just allow me in brackets this just, because you know that it might be difficult. You just need to program it. You are allowed for multitasking. The consumption power is uh, normally average because uh, um, it's normally average. It's not really optimized. It's not minimum because you are not... Uh, going to optimize the single hardware resource to minimize it. You can have a lot of flexibility because you can write many different type of C codes or whatever other language codes and compile it and make it run on the same time of architecture. But the efficiency, 
let's say that the efficiency in terms of boosting the performances, as we already discussed in my course, it is extremely low because uh, you are you are not, not normally you are not capable of tuning uh, the low level hardware details uh, to uh, make sure that uh, a certain application is uh, optimized for uh, the architecture that uh, that you have in front of you. Uh, the architecture is generic. Other type of platforms that I didn't cover in my course, but I think that you, that have been mentioned uh, by Professor Testarelli in his course, uh, GPUs. Uh, GPUs are a, a specialized type of processors uh, that were originally designed to accelerate graphic rendering. And there's a lot of parallelism in, in, in GPUs uh, that you can exploit. Uh, the GPUs uh, can process many pieces of data simultaneously uh, over these uh, uh, parallel chunks uh, of, uh, of architecture. Uh, let's say that GPUs complement uh, the, 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 the CPUs because they are uh, uh, specifically, uh, think, uh, specifically conceived uh, to um, deliver, to, to, to implement uh, data, para data parallel processing. Last uh, ah, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, performances, uh, again, uh, the, the development time is medium, uh, not short, because you need uh, more advanced uh, programming skills. Normally, you don't have multitasking. The power consumption is high because uh, typically uh, the, 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 when you, you have a lot of parallel resources uh, that are operating at the same time, so you are wasting, you are consuming a lot of power. You have a medium flexibilities because not all of the codes are suitable to be compiled and executed on this kind of architecture in an efficient manner. And an efficiency that it's not low but medium because uh, having in mind parallel applications uh, to be used on this target, uh, you, you can find a, a bit of matching be, between the application and the architecture. So this matching makes uh, the efficiency higher than in uh, uh, normal traditional CPUs architecture. Last but not least, uh, I will not spend many, many words on these slides because it's something that you know, ASICs versus FPGA. We are not talking here about uh, generic computing platform. We are talking here about uh, speci application specific computing platform on, on the ASIC side uh, and uh, field programmable gate array on the FPGA side. In both cases, you design the circuit you want to execute upon the needs of the application that you want to execute. This means that uh, the development time is generally higher. I'm talking about generally higher, but uh, uh, there will be simplification processes as, I, as I'll talk at the end of the presentation in Comfort Drones. But in general, it's high because you need to define the hardware, and this uh, requires uh, hardware uh, development skills. You can achieve multitasking because you can define a parallel uh, a parallel architecture you can define a parallel uh, that many parallel data paths and you know that the data path is uh, the one executing the data that are operating uh, in parallel the power consumption is low because you customize your architecture upon the needs uh, that you have it is higher in fpga because fpga are configurable and not uh, specifically sized, and you know the difference, uh, but, but uh, in, in general is certainly lower than in, uh, in the case of uh, GPUs and CPUs. The flexibility is low. It's uh, for sure it's extremely low in the, uh, the ASIC case. Uh, in the FPGA case, it's somehow in the middle because uh, there, there are possibility for reprogramming an FPGA either at, uh, at runtime, but still, uh, it's low with respect to the other two categories. The efficiency is high because uh, you customize the architecture upon the needs that, that you have. 
this picture basically put together all, all the trade-offs that I, that I mentioned and basically creates uh, somehow a, 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 a classifica, okay? Uh, classify them upon flexibility. The, the most flexible one are the CPUs, the least flexible one are the ASICs, uh, uh, the most efficient one are the ASICs because in ASIC design you don't waste one transistor because if it's there it means that it's used. In CPUs uh, the, the efficiency is the less because uh, uh, it's, uh, it's generic and, and you will use the same platform uh, for, uh, for everything. Basically this concludes uh, uh, the, the first part. Uh, Danny, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Good morning, Diane. Perfectly. So stage is okay. yours. The first, uh, in this part of the seminar, what we are going to do is to do uh, an introduction on uh, how are the drones normally used in smart and precision agriculture. And uh, basically, uh, we have divided the, the fields of applications in two. The first one is the, the monitoring that is uh, what at least in the last in the seminar given by Luca they explain it's that when you go to the field and you use the drone to let's say fly around the the field to analyze how is the how are the plants or how is the soil things like this and in the other case is where you go to the field and you act over the plants, meaning that you, for example, spray some kind of, uh, or just spray the plants to treat a pest or something like that. So first, focusing on the monitoring part, you can find different missions. And these missions basically means uh, what kind of, uh, uh, what do you want to do on the field? For example, in the first case, uh, you uh, you can or you might want to know the state of the vegetation of the different plants or whatever. In the second case, you may ana uh, want to analyze the soil so as to understand how is the, the irrigation of the plantation behaving. You know, that is called normally the water stress. And the last part is when you go to the field to analyze if there is any kind of uh, problem. For example, you have some pipes that are draining. Then, uh, second part of this uh, monitoring uh, analysis is the kind of equipment that the uh, drone need to have on board. The first thing, as uh, Francesca already explained, is the inertia measurement unit. And you need this basically to be able to fly uh, the drone properly because it will uh, analyze the acceleration and rotation of the drone. And uh, in, uh, uh, as a result, you will have the position of the drone. Then uh, regarding the uh, GNSS or the GPS, basically you want to answer the question where is my drone in the field uh, the third one is a, a sensor called lidar which is light detection detection and ranging sensor that basically the use laser technology to map the, ter uh, the terrain and this is normally used to uh, develop 3d maps or 3d models of of your uh, of your field and finally for this monitoring you uh, obviously need to use uh, cameras and these cameras uh, may uh, be of different nature for example the rgb cameras are the standard ones the ones that we have in the mobile phone then the multi-spectral cameras are the ones that goes a bit 
into the ultraviolet uh, range of uh, spec of the electromagnetic spectrum or into the infrared and in the case of the thermal cameras i think uh, that in the last uh, seminar luca gave an example using thermal cameras if i remember properly and basically uh, they use a bit of information from the infrared uh, spectral uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum uh, next the next one uh, well the well and you may have uh, many more different uh, equipment on board if your uh, mission is quite specific but if we analyze all the monitoring in terms of the things that the drone has to do or better said the things that it has to do uh, and can be done on board or as Francesca said online during the mission the first one will be obviously the flight control because the drone has to fly because it doesn't if, if not it, it makes no sense to use a drone then the navigation uh, task which basically means that when the drone flies it has to do it uh, properly and for example if you find a tree you have to avoid that tree uh, uh, and try to not crash into it then the third task will be the data acquisition in this case uh, since we are always uh, talking about monitoring we need to get the information and this could be just taking the images like the rgb the thermal or the multispectral to map the terrain with the lidar or just to know where the drone or the rover is using this gps the fourth task will be processing this data and with all the data that you have acquired you can infer real information not just uh, the data you can have uh, information that is useful for for the farmer or even for us as engineers and for example you can get the uh, ndvi index uh, the as i mentioned before you can analyze the water stress or as luca explained in the previous seminar you can even count grapes uh, the next task will be the control of the mission and in this case you have to let's say decide what are you going to do during the during the mission for example you can plan the path that the drone is going to follow or you can detect uh, the analyzing the images that you have taken the different targets or the, uh, that needs to be, for example, uh, irrigated. Uh, since in this case, you can even detect if there is any kind of pest in your uh, plantation. And this leads to the next uh, type of uh, application, which will be the spraying missions. In this case, you can either have uh, the crop spraying as i mentioned before or the uh, treatment of the different fruits and trees in your plantation in this case the equipment that you will need in on board will be uh, more or less it could be more or less the same than before but in this case the important thing is that you have to add another uh, equipment which is basically the uh, spraying dispenser or the spraying arm which is basically used to spray whatever you want to spray uh, then the to the list of tasks that we already had during the monitoring uh, which is which are basically these five ones where okay we said flight control but of course it could be drive control if we have a rover because as uh, Francesca said in this case we we can substitute easily 
the rotors by wheels, and we have go from drone to rover. And to this list of tasks, the only one that is uh, added is the so-called actuation. And this means that you have to go somewhere in your plantation and apply some kind of treatment or spray something on this uh, target. Then, uh, in the, uh, the paper that uh, Francesca mentioned before, we have done an analysis, a survey of the different uh, application that we have found in the, in the literature, state of the art. And all the papers we have found have divided this, uh, their work in these two different uh, applications, the monitoring and the spraying, and they have divided the, the different uh, missions that they have to do in the ones I mentioned during this uh, presentation. But the important thing that we have to take into account is that not uh, in, ev in each uh, paper, on each work that we have found, we have not seen any work that is fulfilling all the tasks that uh, we have mentioned during this presentation. And this doesn't mean that the they work is bad or that their approach is not valid. No, it means that it, we don't need to fulfill all the tasks in order to actually do something useful. For example, if you uh, go to uh, the example that where uh, Luke, that Luke explained uh, in the last seminar, they are using the drone uh, to take pictures and then these pictures are analyzed uh, offline in the laboratory so as to count uh, the number of grapes. In this case, we will be doing the flight control, the navigation and the data acquisition. And it doesn't mean that this work is not valid. It's just that the, the, the tasks that can be fulfilled online are only these three uh, tasks. Uh, this would end the part of, well, well, sorry. In this case, in these tables, you can find all the works that we have analyzed ordered with the same numbers that we have used in the table that in the slide before, in case you want to uh, check what uh, the, the different details of uh, each specific work. Then, uh, in order to have a, a better idea or to have a, a mental image of what I have explained here, uh, we uh, asked ourselves uh, a question that is, okay, but how is all this processing actually done in reality or how would we want to do this kind of processing? So we started with uh, the different uh, parts of the analysis where we started with the sensing. This sensing data has to be pre-processed. Uh, then you will have main tasks and then you will do some kind of pro post-processing. And one thing was clear, the sensing was obviously done uh, on the drone or the rover, meaning that this part will be always uh, online. Then uh, you will either collect this data and analyze it uh, later or send the data to a ground station so as to accelerate a bit the, the processing of this data. But in every case, uh, the drone will do online processing and the workstation will do offline processing. Then uh, in this processing schema, we have to add the main tasks and uh, we consider that the actuation is normally done by a rover, which is not always the case because you can actually do the actuation uh, with the drone too. But uh, if I remember well, 
in the Comfort Drones project, which is the, the project we are working on, the actuation will be always done by a uh, rover. Is that right, Fra? Yeah, yeah. Okay. The the actuation is limited to the to the, to the rover. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Which is why we put the the rover in that part of the schema. In this case, we started thinking, OK, we have the sensing, we have the main tasks, we have if we want to send the data, but in the middle, we still have some. Some parts. That, well, OK, yeah, some parts where uh, we have to add or to prepare the data that we get with the sensors in order to feed the main tasks. So there will be some uh, some pre-processing tasks. And then if we want to increase the security of the of the system, we can even uh, include some post-processing tasks like compressing the data that we want to send to save bandwidth normally or to encrypt this data so as to uh, increase this security. Uh, and then we thought about how is everything connected. Yeah, like this. And uh, we uh, realized that all the data, all the data, all the process of analyzing the, the data that we get, uh, could be either distributed either online or offline. And in this work, what we want to that's it. What we want to focus on is to uh, is on the parts that are done online. Which is why in the next section of the in the next part of the seminar, we will focus on uh, the tasks, the main tasks that are processed online. And we have to think about how are we going to process this data? And we, when I say I, I, I mean uh, the state of the art papers, uh, how are they processing it? And in the case of our lab, how are we going to deal with it in comfort drones? Uh, Danny, can I add yeah. something on these slides before going sure. uh, further? Uh, if I were a student, uh, uh, I, I were going to ask myself, probably I was going to ask myself, uh, why do you need to encrypt uh, data in the in the smart uh, in in a smart farming uh, or smart uh, agriculture case? Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, all, all the other tasks uh, are probably kind of clear in terms of uh, why are why they are there but the encryption the encryption uh, uh, for the experiences and uh, the the discussions that I had with some end user uh, it's fundamental in terms of production we don't always think about uh, or students uh, okay do not always think about uh, uh, the, the, the real usage of a certain technology, but think to Sele Mosca, okay? You all know Sele Mosca probably. Do you think that Sele Monsa, uh, Mosca would love to disclose his product, its production data to possible competitors? The answer is not. So also the encryption is fundamental in, in this uh, processing chain. So. I wanted to specify this because all, all the, the other things uh, are kind of uh, clear, even compression, because uh, you, 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 are, you have already attended some courses related uh, to transmission, and you know that data are huge unless you compress them, and when you compress them, you send them in an easier manner. But even encryption, even in this, in, in this, uh, in this kind of context, uh, it's important. Filippo, am I right? Yeah, but <clears throat> for example, so the Mosca has the problem to control every part of the field. If we, I remember that uh, the dimension in, uh, in terms of fields of so the Mosca is 600 hectares. 
is a difficult to uh, control with a single drone this type of uh, extension of fields. But uh, Solemoska program the control of the disease, for example, in a, a single part of the farm during the year. And uh, this type of uh, application, for example, uh, the possibility to, to have uh, under control during the time uh, of uh, drought of the, the grapes, in general, of the wine and uh, have more data during the, during the year, uh, have time to monitoring the wine yard during all the, the time of production, give a, a very big amount of data uh, but it's better to find data with uh, the terms of uh, information because the data is, uh, uh, in general is a number but for the agronomist, for the, the people that work in the wine yard it's important to understand this data, uh, the, the meaning of this data. Uh, for example, the application of spraying is uh, important because uh, is, uh, we have the possibility to 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 create a con, um, different uh, combination of action. Uh, for example, uh, to create a application of the spine in a, a in the field by the tractors or uh, modify or prefer, for example, use the drone, uh, prefer the drone to the tractors. Uh, this type of information give a, a repeat, give a big amount of, uh, uh, of information and uh, the choose of the actions for the control of the disease is in, uh, uh, in general uh, for the normal uh, for the normal activity in field that uh, that complete the, the pharmacy in the mosca is uh, uh, apply uh, the, uh, the pesticides with uh, the a normal uh, Tractor and uh, uh, the difference uh, is uh, very, very, very important because the tractor normally uh, uses consume times in uh, uh -huh. or complete the operation in uh, two hours, two, three hours uh, of work. The drones can complete the operation in the same field, in the same extension of field, for example, two or three hectares, in 60 minutes, 25 minutes, depend on the, on the type of road, of course, on the type of ply that we apply for complete the, the action, but reduce the amount of volume of water the farmers use for the complete the control of the disease. Normally, the tractor, for example, uses uh, 200 liters for uh, for trip for complete, for example, one hectare. The same drones with this type of information. The, this type of application can reduce the use of volume of water by. 50%. Yeah, I depend will mention uh, on the uh... depend on the <laughs> on the tank uh, transported by the carried by the the drones. And Other... this will be basically the the goals uh, of of comfort drones uh, project among the the goals this, of a comfort yeah. <laughs> But for for Shereboska, it's important to reduce uh, the the 
the number of the trips in the in So number... we will sell them the technology in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, uh, in the previous slide, we have seen that there are several tasks that has to be done or carried out on board. And to do so, we can use either CPU, GPU, or FPGA solution, as we will see in the next uh, section of the seminar. So, as I mentioned before, during this part, what we are going to do is to present the different uh, solutions that can be adopted so as to uh, process the or to uh, execute the different tasks and the different application on board the drone. So. To, but the first thing that we have to understand is the concept of companion computer. Um, basically, uh, this concept was born because uh, on board the drone, you need to have something that is, let's say, uh, simple or something that is efficient enough to uh, be able to do everything uh, properly. And in this case, we divided the, the structure of uh, the computing on board, on board the, the drone in two parts. We have first the mastermind, which is basically, uh, uh, which uh, function, uh, functionality is basically orchestrating all the different uh, things that the drone has to do uh, on board. So basically it is in charge of distributing all the tasks. So, Fra, if you go to the next slide, another one. And then we have the so-called companion, uh, which is normally a system on chip that is uh, basically in charge of executing some specific uh, tasks that are delegated by the mastermind. Like in this example, for example, is the data acquisition. And uh, this is, the, let's say, the general structure. But if we go to, uh, for one example, this mastermind is normally uh, implemented using uh, a CPU because, as we mentioned before, they are uh, quite flexible. So they are normally able to distribute the tasks uh, efficiently. And then we have in this system on chip, different uh, types of architecture. For example, we can have a CPU, a GPU, or as in this example, an FPGA, where uh, the FPGA itself will be in charge of the data acquisition and the software part of the FPGA, the ARM, will be in charge of the communication with this mastermind in order to synchronize everything uh, properly. Then and as I mentioned before, uh, this can be done with CPU, GPU, and FPA. One important thing that we have to take into account in, during this uh, part of the seminar is that even if we are focusing on uh, a smart and precision agriculture, this concept of companion computer or this concept of onboard processing is not uh, only applicable to this field. But so in this part of the seminar, we are going to analyze uh, the different works that we have found in the literature independently of the field of application. So if they use a drone and onboard computation, it probably will be in this analysis. So first things that we are going to analyze are the CPU solutions. And one example of, uh, of this uh, kind of solution where all the main tasks are fulfilled because in CPU, since they are quite flexible, you can do a lot of things, is this one. In this one, they use uh, an Android platform as a mastermind where they execute a set of tasks, and then they have uh, this micro Arduino, for example, in order uh, to uh, do the actuation task. 
then they also have the pix hook to control the flight and etc cetera, etc cetera. this uh, specific uh, example uh, next what it actually does is to detect the the target that they need to irrigate and since the drone is flying they need to look to take pictures analyze the, analyze them and the part of the mission control is to decide whether they have to actuate or not and last part is actually going there going to the target uh, plant and to uh, apply uh, the treatment which means that they are actuating over the the field itself then the next example will be uh, a system in which uh, what they do is to follow a track uh, as we can see on the left side of the of the in, of the slide uh, they are on a track and they can um, with the images they they take and the image they, the images they process they are able to know if they are on the left on the center or on the right of the track so in order to uh, always try to be in the middle in order to follow this track this system was implemented using uh, a neural network which is a concept that uh, Luke already introduced in his seminar uh, two weeks ago but just to have a, a brief example of what is this uh, this kind of uh, algorithms were born to imitate or to replicate the behavior of the brain when they uh, when we process or when we try to make a decision and in this case this is a simple example where this neural network will uh, decide if something is actually a drone or not and for example it could analyze whether it flies or not the material uh, that is used to build the thing because we cannot call it drone yet if it has rotors sensors whether it is alive or not and uh, where are we and with this information it can decide whether it is a drone or not and it will give us a response this can be applicable to almost any uh, type of uh, rational and uh, with the proper inputs you will get a response then the the next example uh, is basically a uh, uh, 3d position tracking 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 sorry uh, in this case we have a drone which is called the infiltrator with this is obviously not applicable not applied to agriculture uh, and this infiltrator has to go to this goal in blue and the main mission it has is to avoid the patrol in red which is another drone that is basically flying and this is a really good example because in here you can realize that obviously the drone has to fly it has to navigate it needs to take pictures and also analyze them so as to uh, locate the pat the patrol and to decide the path it should follow so as to not uh, cross or to not encounter this patrol one uh, interesting point of this uh, solution is that they collaborate with a ground ground station which is shown here uh, on the right where uh, which means that okay you don't need to do everything on board to do uh, the different uh, tasks online because uh, if you remember francesca explained that if you do tasks online it means that you are doing them during the uh, mission so you can actually do on board and off board processing at, sa at the same time and both of them can be uh, online processing because you can collaborate with this uh, ground station and then these examples uh, you can say okay well, 
we are in a course of agriculture, so why are you explaining me this? Because it has a potential use. Because if you use the drones uh, in a field and you uh, have also farmers in this field, you can use this very same uh, position tracking so as to avoid farmers. Because one thing that the regulation of drones says is that you cannot fly over uh, farmers. So you cannot use the drone or the drone can't be over you if you are in the field. Just basically is to be uh, because of safety reasons, because if the drone crash, crashes and it crashes on top of you, maybe you will get hurt and you don't want that. So this could be used in this uh, in, in the agriculture field, like uh, using farmer avoidance. And uh, the next example is almost uh, farther from the, the agriculture point of view. But as you can see, this concept of the main tasks and the companion computer is also applicable when you are not even on Earth or not even flying. So you are not using a drone or a rover, but you are using a boat in this case, which is an unmanned uh, unmanned aqua aquatic vehicle, where in this case you are using a Raspberry Pi and a pig's hook to control not the flight, not the drive, by, but the uh, navigation itself on the on the sea or on the lake or uh, wherever you want. And you are using exactly the same tasks and the same structure and the same platform, let's say, or uh, architecture, uh, compu computing architecture that we uh, uh, defined before this companion computer. This uh, is the last example of the CPU uh, solutions. So now we can move to th this GPU based solutions where, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, you don't have the same flexibility, but these kind of platforms are especially uh, conceived to uh, perform graphic processing. So uh, in this case, we will find a lot of uh, image processing, like in this case, where uh, we have a, a drone that is equipped with a GPU and it does not have a GPU. And this is uh, useful because there are uh, places where the GPS, GPS is actually not working because you don't have uh, enough network, let's say, and uh, you cannot use the, the GPS. But this, uh, this work, this work, they presented uh, a drone that is able to analyze the images that it uh, that it gets, so as to follow the trail uh, crossing a forest, which can be useful, for example, to uh, locate people that is lost uh, in the middle of the forest or something like this. Then the next example are uh, also products that are already built uh, drones and already built rovers that are used to deliver uh, goods. Uh, <coughs> in this case, well, you have here uh, the link to the piece of news where they explain these uh, two products and there you will find uh, a video of each where they use this uh, drone and this rover during the COVID-19 uh, quarantine, uh, quarantine. The first one, the, the drone was used to, to deliver goods in, let's say, remote places where, and by doing so, you don't have to get in touch with the, the person, so you avoid contact and minimizing the, the risk. And in the case of the rover, it was able to, uh, to drive uh, by its own in cities in, in Asia, where obviously they are uh, quite uh, cro uh, crowded. And it was able to uh, deliver the goods in the middle of the city, wherever the person uh, wants to meet the rover. 
if we go to the next example, uh, this one uh, is basically a drone that is, or this is also a, an already built-in product, so you can buy this drone, and it is used to uh, analyze the the windmills and the power uh, towers and things like this. And this is uh, quite useful because uh, if you use a drone, the the human does not have to go up and to risk uh, their lives because if, uh, these towers and these windmills are actually quite high and you can, f uh, uh, you can fall from there. And this is uh, potentially used also, well, it has a potential use also uh, in the field of agriculture because some trees are also quite high. So you can use this uh, drone in order to analyze the status of the tree or to inspect the, the top of the tree. You, can, you have here also uh, a link to uh, a video where they explain uh, how it is used and how they work. And basically they have this flight control, uh, the drone is able to navigate, and what they do is to take images of these, uh, these towers or these, these windmills in order to analyze them afterwards. So they take the images online and they process them offline. Then if we move to the next one, in this case, uh, there's another work uh, from, from a university in Spain where they use the drone and they have attached uh, a hyperspectral uh, camera, which is the one on, on the bottom left. And uh, in this case, uh, they do online uh, compression, these images, and they send them to the ground station. These images uh, collect uh, information from a wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum, basically going from the infrared to the ultraviolet, and you have uh, hundreds of megabytes of information. But the good things of these uh, images is that they can build a signature of each uh, pixel meaning that uh, you can actually distinguish between the different materials that are present in your image. In this simple example, you have, a, well, this is a, an helicopter, but could be perfectly a drone, and it is taking an image of, a, a, of an area where you have soil, you have water, and you have a vegetation, and as you see, on the right side of the of the image, you have a different uh, signature uh, for the different materials. So if you apply this to the agriculture, you can actually uh, be able to distinguish the different, uh, let's say, materials in the image. So in the next slide, we have an example where uh, it is used Let's say this is quite similar to the to the to accounting the percentage of vegetation that you have in your field. In this case, for example, uh, they used the drone to take the image uh, from a certain high height, and they are able to distinguish between vegetation, shadows, and soil. So, uh, starting from a hyperspectral image that is quite big you will have a, a resulting image with three colors. In this case, even if it is not quite clear in this example on the right side, you have only three colors, green, red, and blue. And green represents the vegetation, blue represent, represents the soil, and the red represents the shadows. So if you are able to compute the percentage of vegetation that you have in your field, you will in the end be able to compute the amount of water that you have to use uh, in order to irrigate the field. And uh, as uh, Professor Gambella already said, 
this is quite important if you want to save money. Uh, so this is basically uh, the example using hyperspectral images. And now we have another example where they use drones in order to monitor quarantine zones. This is also applied to COVID-19. And in this case, what they do was to plan the, the flight of the drone, which is basically surrounding this building in the image. And the drone will be able to fly, to navigate, because it will not crash into the building. Uh, it will take the images and it will process them so as to locate if someone is outside when they shouldn't be. This uh, kind of application has a potential use in the agriculture field because you can use this application so, are, so as to surveil not the building, but your field. And in this case, you can avoid, let's say, people that shouldn't be in your field to get in or animals that shouldn't get in your field. Uh, you will locate them before they, for example, eat your crops. Uh, the next example is also uh, one based on GPU. And in this case, they used the GPU so as to fly the drone inside a building uh, where, in, as you can see in this image, they put uh, like towers of boxes that the drone didn't know that they were there. And it has to avoid the, the boxes. And the, objecti the objective is to find the person that is uh, la laying in, on the ground in this image. And basically, the, the, they uh, motivated this work, saying that if the building crashes, if one building crashes, you will have a, a cluttered uh, indoor space. And you, it's better if you do not, do not go inside and you send a, a drone in order to locate possible victims or possible objects uh, inside. This could be also used in the agriculture field by, for example, when you have a, a forest fire where you can't get inside or you can get uh, in quite uh, fast, but you can send the drone in order to locate possible people or animals that are trapped in these forest fires. Uh, this is the last example of GPU. So if we move to FPGA. Yanni, yep. before moving to FPGA, I want to mention two things. Uh, well, the first one is that uh, you, you mentioned at the beginning, but I want to, to stress the attention again on this. In known of the examples using GPUs, all the tasks were fulfilled. Because as, man, as Danny said at the beginning, the flexibility of the computing platform on board is way less than uh, in uh, uh, the um, CPU case. Uh, images were used a lot, and this is something that we were expecting because uh, when you are processing an imaging, there's a lot of parallel processing that you can do over multiple images if you have multiple camera, over multiple pixels if, if pixels uh, can be uh, processed in parallel. And then, uh, the second thing that, uh, that, well, the last thing, the third thing that I want to mention is that uh, uh, in, in many of the examples uh, in, uh, of the GPU part, you were not, uh, the, Danny didn't present the architecture. He just mentioned that a GPU was used. And uh, not because we are lazy that we didn't put to, to, we didn't want to put the slides about the architecture. It's because uh, most of the times when you are talking about products on the market, of course vendors are uh, jealous about their products. So the, the the inside architecture is not disclosed. They said, okay, we are using we are leveraging on this technology to get these performances but uh, how it is connected, how, it is, uh, uh, how the resources are orchestrated, it's not uh, something that it's available to the public. Sorry, Danny, for the interruption. So please, worry, go ahead. Yeah. Thank, 
thanks for the the details. I forgot to mention them. Thanks. Uh, and well, the last part of this uh, section is uh, the one presenting the solutions that are actually based on FPGAs. In this case, uh, I will not forget to mention, <laughs> uh, the solutions are uh, quite more uh, specific and they are more specialized, but it's true that they do not cover so many different tasks uh, at the same time. So if we go, for example, to the first example, uh, oops. Yeah. in this case, as you can see, the drone uh, is only used to, uh, well, is only fulfilling online the task of controlling the flight, navigating, and even if it is not in the main task, getting the information. It is acquiring data. In this case, as, you, as represented in the image, you have a rough uh, uh, terrain, and uh, you, uh, with this solution, this is an already uh, built-in solution that you can buy this drone, so we don't have the, the inner architecture. So uh, you will be able, this drone is able to fly always at the same height uh, without, uh, which allows you using this uh, LIDAR technology to map the terrain uh, properly. Because if you uh, get uh, closer and farther, the 3D map will not be so accurate as you at it should be. You have also the link to the, the website where they explain this uh, more in detail. But uh, basically the idea is this one. So if we move to the next example, uh, this one is, uh, I used more or less this image to explain the companion computers, but uh, I simplified the example when I explained it. In this case, basically, they are uh, using this companion computer uh, idea in order to uh, do omnidirectional obstacle avoidance, which means that uh, on the drone, you have cameras through, uh, all around. So you are, have, let's say, a circle of cameras, and you are able to get the data uh, from all the cameras at the same time, and you are able to uh, process them uh, on board in order to avoid obstacles without having to turn the, the drone around. So it will be, uh, it will keep uh, going straight away, but uh, the drone will be aware of the things that are happening on their sides and on the back. And this uh, has a potential use in the agriculture field. For example, if you use a swarm of drones, which means that you have, instead of only one, you can have five, 10, 20 drones working uh, as a group, as a team, in order to, uh, let's say, split the tasks that you want to fulfill or split the, the field in several uh, squares or in, se in several pieces so as to accelerate the analysis or the surveillance of the, of the field. Mm -hmm. So this will be one example. And another one could be this one. As you can see, these uh, solutions are very, very, very specific because in this case, the work uh, is just estimate the attitude of the of the drone. In, in here, uh, if I remember properly, they are not using uh, the a AMU to compute the attitude, but they are uh, taking pictures of the horizon line in order to compute uh, basically the attitude with respect to this uh, horizon line. So they implemented uh, uh, an accelerator on the FPGA and they 
took the image, apply, applied some uh, filters, and they were able to uh, compute this value without using the a a a AMU. Then, if we move to the next example, uh, in this case, this one is not even uh, mount mounted on a drone, but it could easily uh, be mounted on, on one because they are using an FPGA that is uh, already used on some drones. So the only thing, and let me say this only thing, will be put that FPGA on top of a drone. And in this case, what they are using is basically taking a 4K camera, which is a standard camera, but with a really, really, really high resolution. And they are able to uh, track uh, an object, like in on the right of the image, we can see that they are tracking a hand. And this can be used when you use at the same time and on the same field, uh, a drone and a rover. Um, an example of this kind of application would be the, the use case of comfort drones, where you have uh, the drone uh, doing the surveillance and the, dr the rover is following this drone. So we have this initi initiator and follower structure. I think this is the last uh, example that uh, we have in this uh, seminar. And in here you can uh, find all the, the different examples that we have analyzed during this uh, seminar. And as you can see on the left part of the image, we are using, uh, they are using a lot of different platforms. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they can be CPU, GPUs, or FPGAs. The different, uh, the, the products of these uh, uh, solutions are also different because if you see a name there, uh, well, if you see custom solution, it means that is normally a research paper where they also provide the architecture that they use, the, the way they connect the, the companion computer to the mastermind. And then you have this, uh, other ones where they are already built in solutions. So they are products that are commercial commercialized normally for by these providers in the column in the middle. Then if we analyze the tasks that are fulfilled, we can see that uh, the first lines have, have more ticks than the last ones. And this is basically because uh, on the first rows, the CPUs are the, the solutions that have been taken, while in the last part, the FPGA-based solutions are the one that have, has been considered. I would say that this is the last slide I have in, well, again, the references of the, of the paper we have used. And now, Francesca, it's your turn. Okay, Filippo. Uh, till what time do we have for uh, overall? 11.30 or less? Yeah, yeah for, uh, uh, okay. for 11.30, <clears throat> uh, okay. the, the seminar is ended. Uh, okay, uh, I, I will try to conclude in more or less 10-15 minutes to give time to students if they want to ask yeah. more questions. So, uh, I will switch now to the Comfort Drones uh, project itself. Uh, Basically, this project applies the technologies that you have seen so far. Uh, the project is not coordinated by the University of Sassari. It's, an inter it's um, coordinated by Indra, which is a large uh, multinational company in, in Spain. And the scientific coordinator of the overall proposal is uh, from SEA, a research institute, uh, uh, a French research institute. Uh, I want you to uh, understand the size of the project. It's a three years project with eight nations involved, more than 50 partners that has a budget or more or less 30 million. The, the European Commission is investing 30 million to develop technologies uh, uh, that are useful for future so important societal uh, challenges, as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, 
uh, these are the, the set of partners uh, involved uh, and uh, the goals of the project is not smart agriculture itself. The goals of the project is uh, about technologies. So it is important when you are dealing with drones, with unmanned vehicles in general, uh, aerial uh, um, uh, vehicles that can go on, uh, on earth, vehicles that can go under the sea or for uh, uh, subsea and undersea exploration. It is important uh, that you are capable of uh, uh, facilitating uh, the integration of the different components, of customizing the different components. And you know what customization means. So you know that uh, from my course, from my previous course, we, we have been talking about hardware definition and you know how difficult it is uh, to specify uh, the tasks that have to be executed. And you know how, how difficult it is to do it in software and you know how difficult it is to do it in, in hardware, for hardware applications. So you know that tools have to be developed and uh, frameworks to put things together might be extremely useful. Uh, the project so has the goal to develop these, uh, these kind of tools and uh, to develop tools uh, to minimize uh, the effort that it's needed uh, to uh, uh, design and verify uh, the application. Uh, the, the project is investing also on uh, um, ensuring trusted communication. So there, there's a lot of uh, uh, effort in the project and a lot of money dedicated, dedicated to the communi communication medium research. Uh, on uh, uh, enabling the possibility of taking a safe autonomous decision. With safe autonomous decision, I mean that these drones that we are developing in Comfort Drones are intelligent and are capable or should be capable at the end of the project to uh, take decision online without the intervention of uh, the operator. So uh, to understand, okay, I can see a target of my mission there I go there, I operate, uh, and, uh, and then I have ac accomplished my tasks. To, to put it in, a, in the smart agricultural perspective, I can see that uh, in, in that plant uh, there is a disease. Uh, I want to treat it as fast as possible before it spreads. So I call my, my rover friend. My rover friend is coming and, uh, and uh, spraying uh, the, the, over, the, the pesticides needed over in that part of the field over that plant to avoid that, that the disease is, uh, uh, is, is a spread. And I don't need, uh, let's say, Philips, Filippo's help or any other one uh, help uh, to, to decide to take this decision and to go there and operate. Uh, the last goal is something more related to market and I don't want to, don't want to spend a lot of uh, words about it, but it's uh, ensuring so sustainable uh, impact and creating uh, uh, an industry driven community these are concepts more really more related to the market uh, and exploitation of the results exploitation of technologies uh, uh, to make real products uh, for for the market so that uh, the research that we are carrying out uh, as academics do not uh, doesn't stay in in our uh, in our labs but goes uh, outside, goes uh, reach the market and make uh, uh, some, uh, some real values. Uh, that is the return of, of investment that the commission is having, okay? Uh, Comfort Drones project uh, covers uh, many different uh, fields, transport, construction, logistics, surveillance, and, and smart agriculture with the different purpose from parcels uh, uh, delivery to uh, surveillance uh, uh, of uh, uh, remote uh, remote uh, uh, industries or uh, uh, or critical uh, or critical uh, uh, critical infrastructures we are focused we uh, as I, as i'm saying we i'm uh, uh, starting to uh, bring you in what the italian consortium is doing inside comfort drones we are focused on uh, smart and precision agriculture. Uh, the goal of the Italian consortium is uh, to improve uh, non-real-time action. When I mean, uh, when I mention non-real-time action, uh, now you should know that uh, I refer to all the post-processing things that is done 
offline on a workstation uh, after the mission to enable real-time field monitoring and inspection, so uh, to enable all uh, the smart uh, processing on top uh, of the drone, so during the mission, and to guarantee the possibility of uh, um, a, prompt, a prompt intervention on a field, so doing uh, the action exactly where and when is needed uh, through the usage of uh, of a rover. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, these activities, are, uh, Dani already mentioned and I already mentioned that uh, as a technical setup, we have uh, two autonomous vehicles that are meant to cooperate in uh, an initiator follower manner, so in a cooperative manner. The, uh, the drone uh, is uh, uh, our monitoring uh, system and it's, it is our leader in the, in the case of the project. The rover is uh, the follower. Uh, and uh, it has the responsibility of uh, the actuation. So in, in the project, uh, the two things, uh, uh, monitoring and actuation, uh, passive and active uh, uh, tasks, uh, physical tasks, are strongly separated uh, in terms of machineries that will uh, implement them. And uh, in the Italian cluster, there are 12, 12 different partners. The lead of this partner is, uh, is uh, uh, from the, uh, as Filippo mentioned at the beginning, uh, is uh, from the University of, of Sassari. Actually, I'm the, the national coordinator of this project. Uh, and the Department of Agriculture, and, and as uh, um, Idea Lab, you know the lab, you know that uh, it's not just me, but there's also Luca Pulina. We are providing a technical solution to, for solving the problems uh, behind uh, this, uh, this complex project. But we have also involved uh, back in 2018, I think we wrote in 2018 uh, this project, we have involved also the Department of Agriculture, in particular Professor Gambella, to provide the, the, the use case. What is this uh, use case uh, about? We created a story, okay? So I, I will give you, I will talk uh, uh, about the use case uh, in terms of a story. We have this, uh, the, this farmer, John, and, and John is a, is a wise farmer, is a, let's say a modern farmer. He wants to improve his business, but at the same time, he wants to go green uh, to, to, to make sure to respect uh, the, the environment. So the goal for him, the, their needs, uh, are to use uh, uh, as less pesticides as possible. So to do that, uh, there, there's the need of a proper assessment of the health status of the plants and to do the on-spot interventions, as we have mentioned in the previous presentation. And at the same time, uh, you, you want to respect the environment, you want to waste uh, as little water as possible. This means uh, that uh, the, there's really the huge need for a precise assessment of the uh, of the crops growth, okay? So this uh, yeah. proper knowledge, uh, this precise knowledge implies the use of the technologies that we already mentioned. So uh, the, the, the technological setup has to be uh, based on drone, on smart drones and smart rovers with the intent with, of realizing some benefits that I already mentioned. So reduce the impact of the environment, for sure, it's, it was on the primary goals. But at the same time, uh, the, the use of, of smarter technologies or of advanced technologies with the, with the intelligence on board, uh, as we mentioned, will also allow to reduce uh, the human effort because uh, you won't need uh, an operator to go plant by plant uh, to catalog them and to say, this is healthy, this is not healthy, this is healthy, this is not healthy. Think about it. And to, but at the same time, uh, we wanted also, we need uh, the expected benefit is uh, to make sure that uh, these uh, rover, these drones uh, are easily usable by non-expert operators. It means uh, that the computation has to be done on board. It means that uh, I don't want uh, John to stay in front of a computer to run an algorithm to, that will take decisions. I wanted that the algorithm is running on the technologies so that John has just to say, okay, go, fly, 
I don't care about whatever what, whatever is happening while you fly or okay he cares because he doesn't the want uh, <laughs> the, 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 the the technology to crash but theoretically theoretically you want uh, this technology to be smart okay in order to uh, take the decision autonomously in order to have this technology used also by uh, non-expert uh, uh, operators. So we divided this uh, scenario, these overall uh, scenarios in three parts, okay? The first, uh, uh, the first part is uh, uh, the fact that John wants to gather more precise knowledge of, uh, of the drone, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the growth, okay, of the fields, of the, of the crops. So he buys the drone. And uh, the, the goal is uh, to have, uh, to acquire as much information as possible, precise, to size the water and, uh, and reduce pollution. What you need to do that, you should have uh, clear what you need. You need a system like this one. In, in, in this system, we have just the drone and the ground station. And, uh, uh, and which technologies do we have? Uh, in, in the project, we have selected as flight controller uh, a PIX4. Uh, um, that, that is, the PIX, PIX, uh, PIXOC4 is the hardware platform. It has been shown, uh, it is uh, really widely used, uh, and, and Danny shown it in, in many different uh, uh, examples. Uh, the hardware is based uh, on a 32-bit microprocessor, uh, an ARM microprocessor, and uh, it is connected uh, to, to a software that it's the PIX4 uh, PIX uh, software uh, that has all the capability uh, to master uh, the software part of the flight, uh, the, the flight navigation. Uh, uh, so, what, we, what else do we need? Uh, we need also uh, uh, to define, we needed to define uh, the communication link between the drone and the ground station. And uh, we opted for this uh, protocol, the MavLink one, uh, micro air vehicle communication protocol, which is uh, a point-to-point -point, uh, uh, communication uh, standards uh, that can be used for bidirectional communication. In this case, uh, basically the ground station sends uh, uh, control signals uh, to, the, to, the ro uh, to the drone. The drone is capable of uh, acquiring uh, through sensors uh, uh, information. For example, it can use uh, cameras uh, to, to acquire information. In this uh, specific uh, part of the tests, the information will be stored on the drone. So there will be, of course, uh, some storage. And uh, the, uh, there will be a post-processing of the information uh, to, to, to size, uh, as I said before, the water according to the growth of the plants. And, uh, and this will also allow to reduce pollution because uh, I will know exactly uh, um, how, how, ma how many times uh, and, uh, in advance, how, much times do, how, how many tanks uh, will I need to use uh, uh, and... Uh, I will precisely size uh, the execution uh, on, uh, on the field. The second scenario uh, is, again, uh, it's, it, it, let's say that it's incremental. So we will not just do the monitoring, but we will add also some online processing because to become uh, uh, more environment, uh, environmental friendly, our, uh, our uh, farmer, John, uh, he, he would love to intervene promptly and locally on unhealthy, uh, on unhealthy plants. But still, in this second scenario, we are considering the fact that there, there is no actuation, uh, or there is actuation, but the actuation is, uh, is a manual actuation. It will be John that will uh, be told where to go to, to, to act the treatment. The system is uh, still composed of a drone and a ground station, but at the moment, the drone is enriched with uh, the presence of uh, the companion computer that uh, uh, Daniel already presented. The companion computer will run uh, 
uh, it will be based on an FPGA, uh, an heterogeneous F uh, FPGA. I will show it in the next slides. There will be an operating system online, uh, this, uh, this ROS operating system, which is supporting the Mavlink communication protocol that we have chosen, so that uh, uh, the detection of tests will be run online and uh, through the ground station, uh, uh, to, through the information sent to the ground station, John will know where to go to make the actuation. In the last uh, scenarios, uh, we will uh, also relieve John from doing the actuation because uh, what it was normally done by the manual operator, it will be done uh, by uh, the, the rover. And even in this case, uh, there will be a ROS operating system on board, uh, and, uh, and all, of course, all the sprang system will be there to, to do the actuation. Okay, I, I will skip this, but it's, uh, it gives you an idea on, of where we are. At the moment, we are at the second year of the project and we are developing the technologies uh, that next year will be tested uh, on, uh, on field. This is the kind of uh, drones that we will use, so with the companion computer on board, and the kind of companion computer that we have opted for is uh, an FPGA. You already know these slides because it was from my previous course. And as you can see, there's uh, an ARM part plus uh, it's, it's an heterogeneous board. It's not the one that we use during the first, uh, uh, during the second year course. It has an ARM plus uh, the programmable logic. So all the tasks, uh, all the mission tasks uh, related, for example, to disease detection, uh, uh, obstacle avoidance can be uh, carried out in the programmable logic in, a, in, a, in an advanced manner, while uh, the ARM can do, for example, the communication uh, uh, with uh, uh, the, the, flight, uh, the flight, flight control. This is the companion computer, so don't get confused. Uh, the, uh, the UART will be, so this UART will be connected through the, to the flight controller, to the PIXOC that will make the flight navigation and, uh, and, the, and the board uh, will do the advanced tasks. Uh, in, in the project, I will not spend many words about it because uh, I'm really running out of time. Uh, we are using uh, uh, a, a computing infrastructure that is uh, a custom computing infrastructure. It means that uh, uh, we are using a template solution that is called overlay. You don't have to define all uh, uh, the Verilog modules, for example, but you will use uh, a set of tools uh, that will allow you, uh, this tool is called MDC. It's developed in, uh, in the lab, then I will be happy to explain you more about this uh, uh, e even uh, in, in the next course, uh, but this tool is uh, uh, used uh, to uh, translate, uh, for example, a C code uh, into uh, using high level synthesis into the, the hardware that is, uh, that is run on board. So in, in our companion computer, this, uh, this uh, infrastructure, the Eero infrastructure will be used and uh, the hardware part will be defined using a technology that, is, that has been defined by the Idea Lab, that is the Multi Data Flow Composer tool. Uh, I, I want to conclude really uh, with this because otherwise we are running out of time. Uh, at the moment, the architecture is already there. Uh, Dani is already working on the architecture. We still need to validate the architecture in the field of agriculture, which is uh, the discussions that we have opened with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Filippo. And there are many possibilities of working with us uh, on uh, uh, the side of uh, uh, the framework that allows you to go from C code to uh, hardware and on the part that relates the project. So connecting the PIXOC to the FPGA or porting some uh, small uh, agricultural operation, uh, agricultural tasks, uh, relevant tasks uh, on hardware. Uh, 